people. Let's have a seat. Welcome. To Hello, club. Fabulous. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Oakland. We launched this e spade community in 1908. Hello. We're one of 42,000 Rotary Clubs around the world in 200 countries, but we are the third oldest ever, ever formed. We're one of the largest nonprofit community service contributors in the city of Oakland, and we're always looking for ways to contribute to this community and around the world. So welcome. We'd like to introduce our visiting Rotarians and guests. Do we have some guests we can we can now make sure when you introduce yourself you tell us your name and don't be shy what you do. i see some of your people have guests mcaboy you have a guest already well let's start with you then first of all how handsome are you so it's my distinct honor today to introduce my business partner for the last 27 years who today thinks he's an easter egg um, Bill Kramer, you want to stand up so you see what you look like? Yeah. Woo! Welcome, Bill. So happy sweet to pants. See you. Sweet pants. Gary's next. Hey, Tom. Uh, hello, President Shannon. I am very, very pleased to uh, have as my guest today my sister Laura. Well, hello, sister. Nice. Good afternoon, everybody. Isaac Cost Reed, proud member of the Rotary Board this year, and my guest today is my mother, Diana Koss, whose family immigrated from Poland about 100 years ago. Wonderful. Welcome, welcome to the country. Welcome, welcome. All right, Billy, you're going to talk next. Nice tie. Any visiting Rotarians from other no, clubs? No, no, one so more, Jason. Oh, wait, one more guest. One? Oh, hit it, Tom. Hey, hey, Billy. Hi, my name is Bill Palmer. I'm a new member. I haven't been presented yet, so. I don't have the badge and everything, but uh, I'm happy to be here. This is my life partner and, and, and lover and wife, Hyann Schwer, and um, we're both glad to be here. Isn't she lucky? Fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful. Any other guests? And do we have any visiting Rotarians today? Well, we're all visiting Rotarians, technically, right? OK, great. And I'd like to say hello to Wise Allen. Hello, Wise. Nice to see you. Catherine, I'm saying hello to our Zoom family. Linda, Joel, welcome back from Africa. Rick, Merlin, hello, Thomas. Hello, Karen. That doesn't look like Karen. It looks like Karen's husband. I know not CJ. I'm talking about, it says Karen Harris on the line here. Anyway, so good to have you all online and in the room. So with that, I would like to introduce one of our new members, Billy Dixon, for the thought for the day. I promise I'm not going to preach. I just got the iPad up here. Excerpts from Invisible Ink, uh, Invisible Ink by Courtney B. Vance and Dr. Robin L. Smith. But if you hide your tears, if you don't find the words to talk about your anxiety, if you feel that showing vulnerability makes you look weak, you're relinquishing your right to be fully human. Nicely, Nicely done. Let's see. We are going to just say welcome to our traveling Rotarians. I have a little slide of our friends coming back from Africa. They aren't even all back. But I think we have a slide. Welcome back. We're going to look forward to a wonderful program in October, hearing all about this great trip to Africa. And I do want to say, I think traveling is magic. It is magic, and it is part of uh, the Rotary experiences traveling together, and so it'll be really wonderful to, to learn from our traveling Rotarians. So we're going to have a fellowship moment uh, about five minutes this, this afternoon, and we're going to break out the Zoom, the Zoom folks. So the Zoomers are going to have little pairs. You're going to be 
put off into a, you never know, you might even get me, because I'm going to zoom on the breakout. At your tables, we want you to pair up. So please, Jack, pair up with somebody you don't know, please. Um, pair up, and the, um, the thought for the, or not the thought, but the topic of your little um, pairing will be, what kind of program or speaker do you love to hear at this club? And then we're going to have you write it down on the piece of paper. And the Zoomers, we want you to put it in the chat of a couple of um, program or speakers. What, what makes your day when you have a rotary speaker? And then we're going to give that wonderful list to our wonderful speaker committee. I don't know that they can do any better because they've been doing a fabulous job. So take five minutes, team. Second warning. Okay, Fred.
Hi. Twenty seconds. Please write down your responses and please put your responses in the chat. And thank you. All right, let's bring it back to the meeting. Thank you. Good. I hope. How was that? Did you have some interesting conversation? Yeah. Have some interesting conversation. Yes, good. Thank you very much. That was fun. And I, I was blessed to be able to visit with Wise Allen. So at Wise, it was really a pleasure. I'm so glad. Hello, Mark Rosen. Nice to see you. Rochelle. Shelby. Sorry, some new people have joined Zoom. Stephen, good to see you. Pam. Okay, so I wanted to have a little visit with you about the season. Is it election season? It is. It is. What I'd, like to what I'd like to share with everyone is that this club is an inclusive club, and Rotary International in particular works very hard on being inclusive. And when I joined this club 36 years ago, I was in the minority, not only as a female, but in my political party. And the only majority I had was I went to Cal. Go Bears! So I'm going to try and say that we need to be inclusive even of people from Stanford. No, I'm kidding. I didn't really mean that. But in an election season or in any season, I'm reminding all of us that this is, this is a safe place. This is an inclusive place for everybody. And we are not political and we are not religious, and we are all inclusive. So no matter who you're gonna vote for, or if you even vote, or who you, what group you belong to, it's very important that we have a comfort zone in this club for all people, all the time. And this club has changed a lot, and I, I just wanna remind us that we, have, we also have some wonderful members that are running for office and we definitely, we, whoever wants to support them, please do. We have some very brave members that are gonna be running for office or that might currently be running for office and I am, I am grateful for the courage to be in that arena. So we want them to have a safe space too. But this is for, um, this is for everybody. So I just wanted to make that statement real clear and honor everybody in the room and so that we feel comfortable um, no matter what we're doing. Okay, so that's my, that's my inclusivity moment for the club, so. There were only three, <laughs> three of us in the room, David, when I joined. Um, okay, so now we are going to invite um, Marie to the podium. And it, this next event that we're going to talk about is really important. We are investing a beautiful off-site opportunity. We are trying to welcome more people into this incredible international organization and this Oakland organization. And so Maria is going to share with you this event that is happening soon. OK. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. If you don't know me, my name is Marie Sescon. I'm an account manager over at Fast Signs in Jack London Square. Before moving to Jack London Square in 2020, Fast Signs was right across the street on the corner. I had worked in that building for 15 years and had no idea what happened in this ballroom. Now I'm honored to serve as your public relations committee chair and co-chair of Enterprise Institute. Thank you. Before joining Rotary, I had never chaired a committee. And before joining Rotary, I would have never stood on stage to speak in front of a crowd. 
But Rotary helps you grow and connect and get involved in unexpected ways. But Rot in two weeks, on Thursday, September 26, we will not be in this ballroom. Instead, please bring friends and come to Bocanova Restaurant on Broadway from 5 to 7 p.m. for a special off-site meeting. Since joining Rotary in March of 2022, I have been incredibly grateful for the encouragement to get involved early on. It was my gateway to meeting many wonderful Rotarians and discovering the impactful work we do for students, the community, and even around the world. The off-site meeting is perfect opportunity for new members to come and meet our committee chairs, learn about the service projects Rotary leads, and understand the magic of Rotary. <laughs> we want to encourage everyone to bring a friend, or two, or 12. It's a chance for guests to meet Rotarians, hear about our experiences, and see firsthand the rewarding work we do. Don't forget, each member and guest needs to register on Eventbrite for their own ticket. Let's make the off-site meeting a fantastic evening of connection, storytelling, fun, and fun. See you all at Bocanova on the 26th. <laughs> Thank you so much. Talk about magic. I've been doing work with her boss for about 30 years, and she was developing her own. I did. Again. Thank you, boss. Um, I've been doing work with her, her boss for many, many, many years, and she was with developing a young leader, and she's like, Shannon, you should tell Marie about Rotary and talk about a, a win for this organization and for Marie. Thank you so much for being here with us. All right, we have another event that's coming up, Tom, and we have incredible discount to offer, so get your credit card ready, and here it is. All right, help me out here, all right? Here we go. I know you don't, you, this might not resonate with you now, but sort of put yourself back three years ago. Okay. Let's go Oakland. Let's go Oakland. Let's go Oakland. All right, All right. That, that was fun, so thank you. Oh, no, 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 no. You are wearing, you're wearing orange. You're, you've already transferred, huh? No, you were always a Giants fan. It's all right. Anyways. Coming up in a week, Saturday, March 21st, we are having our final, final Oakland A's game with the Yankees and tailgate with the Oakland Rotary. So as I've told you before, I've been doing this for about 12 years with the Rotary Club. This is my final one. I wanted to have a giant tailgate with paella and with like tri-tip and tacos. And then I talked to Ruth and, and Ruth was like, hold on, hold on. That's, you're, that's too much, let's simplify. And so then we started doing the math, and started running the numbers, and we saved a lot of money, and we brought the ticket price down. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> so we're, it's still gonna be delicious, and it's gonna be awesome, but I need more friends there. So please be my friend, Saturday the 21st, 4 p.m. is the tailgate, and the tickets, if you buy them, in the ballroom, on Square, or even phone it into Jesse, $60. These are $94 seats. If you buy it on Eventbrite, Eventbrite charges a big, a big processing fee. It's $65. $60 at the, at the back of the ballroom today or next week. Just, we really, we need your help. We need your numbers. And let's go have a good time, and let's go Oakland. Thank you, Tom. We've had a tradition for many, many years of having awesome tailgate parties. Long before some of you members were members, let's do it. It's fun. It's, it's a wonderful thing to come out and support each other and say goodbye to the team. All right. We have another event that's coming up, hands-on volunteering opportunity. Our community service committee has been doing this for many years. It's awesome, and we'd like to hear from Lois. Good afternoon. I have a little poem I want to read by Teresa. It's a crisp morning, 
October 5th. I wake up so happy that I'm alive. Look out the window, sunny a bit damp. Does it matter at all? I want to do service at PAL camp. Grab your hat and your gloves. Let's meet in the wood. Let the proof, let's fireproof the forest and do some rotary good. Please join us, the community service group and Wendy Takuda on October 5th in Roberts Park from 9 until 1230. We're going to remove the firewood, we're going to pull weeds, and then you get to bond with each other and finally we'll be treated with great food by Kathleen Arebi. Nice. Well done, dear. Thank you so much. Thank you, lady. I mean, Halloween lady. <laughs> Awesome. That's a fun event. I've done it. How many of you have been to the Powell Camp and pulled weeds? It's good exercise. Hello, everybody. It's outdoors. I took some kids there that had never been in our regional parks from Oakland schools, so bring a kid and warn them that they have to have gloves and a mask. <laughs> it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. Okay. Oh, one more event. We are supporting the area with a pickleball tournament and last week some people raised their hands how many know how to play pickleball okay write this down mm -mm. keep it up I'm, I'm taking notes can someone uh, oh I see some more hands okay write it down on your little program um, paper please if you are a pickleball player we're trying to field at least three or four maybe five pairs for the Piedmont Montclair team. They're trying to put 40 teams on the field. They even have a donor that's going to provide some of the um, fundraising for Polio Plus. Polio Plus is something you're going to hear about regularly over the next month. And unfortunately, these are the latest statistics hot off the press. We used to have two or three cases of polio around the world, and Pakistan and Afghanistan are having a terrible outbreak. Yes, sir, Dudley. He needs a mic. When I joined <laughs> this club, it was just kicking off in Polio Plus. Go ahead, sir. As I understand, sponsoring a team is $200. I'm going to be out of town, but I'm willing to sponsor two of our members, two of our best members, because I want them to win. And if they win, I'll throw in an extra 300. So I've got one, guy, one member here, and Tom, I've got two members that I'll sponsor. Awesome. Jesse if anybody Schmitz else looking, wants to sponsor Jesse, team. Jesse Schmidt's looking for a partner. He already asked me, but I already have a commitment. So Jesse's going to be a, a, a ringer. Thank you. Awesome. Good job. Do I ring the bell on that? I'm going to have one, two, three, because that sounds like, sounds like some hundreds. Thank you, Dudley. But the, the goal is, of course, raising awareness about polio, and polio has, is continuing, unfortunately, to cripple children and around the, some uh, mostly war-torn areas. So this wouldn't, we wouldn't be this close if it weren't for Rotary International and the World Health Organization and partners around the world. So um, there will be more on polio. It's important that we support this, this cause and we take care of what we started because Rotary doesn't get enough credit and we want to let everybody know that we, we started this. So with that, we're getting close here. I have um, just one more thing. A slide on the hot squad. The hot squad, many of you have um, put your name on the list and you haven't heard a lot from me um, because my partner in crime, who's online, I think, Carrie, um, we've, the committee's been a little bit hanging out in Africa. So we're going to get back on it in the next couple of weeks. And there are a number of different volunteer opportunities in the queue where we'll start sending out some emails about hands-on volunteering opportunity. So don't lose faith. We have some wonderful things cooking. But right now, we've got the PAL camp. So please come and pull weeds if you like. So with that, I'd like to get our speaker off the ground. And we're going to dim the lights as soon as he comes on. And really excited to have David Stein introduce our speaker. Uh, fellow Rotarians and guests, it's my honor today to introduce Ambassador Daniel Freed. In the course of his 40 years foreign service career, Ambassador Freed played a key role in designing and implementing American policy in Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. 
Ambassador Freed has a BA in Soviet Studies from Columbia University and an MA from Columbia's Russian Institute and School of International Affairs. While a student, he lived in Moscow, so you can see his interest in Soviet affairs goes back to at least before his college day, to his college days. In 1978, he joined the U.S. Foreign Service, serving in Leningrad and Belgrade, and in the Office of Soviet Affairs in the State Department. As a Polish desk officer in the late 1980s, Ambassador Fried was one of the first in Washington to recognize the impending collapse of communism in Poland. He helped develop the immediate response of the George H.W. Bush administration to these developments. As a political counselor at the U.S. Embassy in Warsaw, from 1990 to 93, Ambassador Freed witnessed Poland's difficult but ultimately successful free market democratic transformation working with successive Polish governments. As Special Assistant and National Security Council Senior Director for Presidents Clinton and, and Bush, Ambassador to, uh, then as Ambassador to Poland and Assistant Secretary of State for Europe from 2005 to 2009, Ambassador Freed helped craft the policy of NATO enlargement to Central European nations and, in parallel, the NATO-Russia relations, thus advancing the goal of a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace. Ambassador Freed helped lead the West response to Moscow's aggressions against Ukraine starting in 2014. As a State Department coordinator for the sanctions policy, he crafted U.S. sanctions against Russia, the largest sanctions programs to date, and negotiated imposition of similar sanctions by Europe, Canada, Japan, and Australia. Ambassador Freed also served as the State Department's first special envoy, envoy to the closure of Guantanamo detention facility, where he established procedures for transfer of individual detainees and negotiated the transfers of 70 detainees to 20 countries with improved security outcomes. Ambassador Freed is currently the Wiser Family Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council. He is also on the Board of Directors of the National Endowment for Democracy and a visiting professor at Warsaw, Warsaw University. He remains active in U.S. foreign policy. Ambassador Freed is here today to, talk, to discuss the current state of relationships between the U.S., NATO, and Russia and the latest developments in Ukraine. Please give a warm Oakland Rotary welcome to Ambassador Daniel Freed. Thank you for that introduction. <clears throat> My professional experience ought to be irrelevant, and I wish it was, because that would mean that American policy succeeded in its effort to build a Europe whole, free, and at peace after the end of the Cold War. And the outreach to Central and Eastern Europe worked out just as we had hoped. A hundred million people, after the overthrow of communism, built, generally speaking, democracies and prosperous free market economies. That part worked out pretty well. The part with Russia did not work out at all. We tried to invite Russia to become a normal nation, living at peace with itself and its neighbors, and to integrate Russia into a wider open community. That didn't work out because after a failed attempt at building a democratic country, Russia chose the course of autocracy at home and empire abroad. And that's what we're seeing in Ukraine and what we saw before in Georgia, uh, a country that Russia attacked in 2008. Vladimir Putin is fighting a war of imperial restoration. The Russian propaganda machine says that the Ukrainians do not exist as a nation except in alliance with and subordination to Russia. And as Kamala Harris, I think, rightly said during this week's debate, if Russia wins in Ukraine, they're going to eye the rest of Europe for targets of opportunity. So this is an ugly business. Now, <clears throat> the Ukraine war is going on right now, and nobody knows the outcome. People who say that Ukraine's 
victory or Russia's victory is inevitable don't know what they're talking about. <clears throat> we don't know who's going to win. Victory is up in the air. <clears throat> that places a special responsibility on the United States and Europe <clears throat> because we can put our thumb on the scale. We can help Ukraine succeed, but that's assistance. I can't guarantee that any amount of American assistance would make the difference. On the other hand, those who say that Russia's victory is inevitable really don't know what they're talking about. There's a kind of a myth that Russia will always win wars, that it's got an infinite capacity for suffering. And that view is built out of memories of Soviet resistance to Nazi Germany in World War II. But Russia law has lost plenty of wars. It lost the Crimean War in the mid-19th century. It lost the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. It lost World War I to the Germans in 1917, and they were saved only by the Americans coming into the war to beat Germany. Uh, you're welcome. And they lost the Afghan War. <clears throat> and after each loss, there was internal reform and sometimes upheaval in Russia. Russia can be beaten. But take a step back. Why do we care? What is the American interest in Ukraine specifically and frankly in Europe? And that's a question that has been raised in this year's political campaign. And it deserves an answer. Our interest, our American interest in European security is the same interest we had in World War II and the Cold War. We think it's in our interest if Europe is not subjugated by hostile dictators. We fought two world wars in the Cold War for that very purpose, not out of charity, but because we knew that Europe under control or intimidated by Nazi or Soviet communist dictators would not be our friend, but our adversary. And we needed Europe as a friend a partner and a co-pillar of what some people call the rules-based international order, but we used to call the free world. That's not charity. U.S. support for the free world is not idealism. It is based on a canny and correct assumption that our American prosperity will grow the greater the world is free and open and not subject to closed empires. Roosevelt and Churchill knew this. Anybody can read the Atlantic Charter. It's not very long, one page. It basically says an open free world is going to be better for the world. It's going to be better for us. That's the American grand strategy. Now there's another American grand strategy. It's called isolationism. And this is a view that the world doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether the world is free or not, that America can, do its America can do its deals. The trouble with that is it would diminish us. We could do deals with foreign empires and we would be confined and to our own immediate neighborhood and cut out of the world. That would not work out very well for us. It certainly would not work out for the work out for the people subjugated by foreign empires, whether Russian or Chinese. Does Europe matter? Well, together, the United States and Europe, if you throw in Great Britain, account for almost half the world's GDP. Throw in Japan, South Korea, Australia, and we're getting up to 60%. That's not everything, but that's a lot. We have a China challenge in the world, and people have rightly pointed out that China is a bigger challenge than Russia. Russia is more virulent, more aggressive, more dangerous immediately, but China is bigger. That's true. But to deal with China, we are in better shape. We have the higher ground if we're aligned with Europe, working with them, and if Europe isn't intimidated by Russia. There are those who say we need to pull out of Europe and concentrate on Asia, the Asia first crowd. These aren't original, they've been around. 
In the late 1940s, 1950s, they were similar, opposed to NATO, thought that China was the big challenge and Europe was a distraction. But it seems to me that if Vladimir Putin wins in Ukraine, our problems don't get better, they get worse. Our liabilities increase, our assets diminish. Don't take my word for it. The Japanese, South Koreans, and Taiwanese all support Ukraine. They do not say that we, the assistance we give to Ukraine should better be given to them. They say that it's important to help Ukraine win. The Japanese, South Koreans, and Taiwanese. Now that's a sketch of American interests. Europe, as was said in the debate, but said rather poorly by former President Trump, Europe does need to pay more for its own defense. Now, Europe is paying, is supporting Ukraine, paying more to help Ukraine than the United States by quite a bit. They are paying quite a bit more. Trump got that wrong. But he's right that Europe does need to spend more on its own defense. And some of the European countries are waking up to that fact. Germany in particular, well, German politics are a little rough right now, but they know, Germans know, you go to Berlin, you talk to them, they know they've got to do more. The Poles are doing more. They are spending 4.7% of their GDP on, def on defense, which is twice the agreed NATO level. But Europe does need to do more. But abandoning Europe is not going to advantage anyone. Now, as we speak, the Ukrainians attacked a Russian province as a way to balance the scales. And today, yesterday and today, the Russians opened a counteroffensive in Kirk, Kursk province to try to retake it. The Russians were advancing in the eastern Ukrainian on the eastern Ukrainian front toward the city of Pokrovsk. That advance seemed to, seems to have slowed in recent days. My point is that the battle hangs in the balance. Ukraine is attacking inside Russia. Russia is attacking and trying to destroy Ukraine's energy infrastructure. It's an ugly war. The Biden administration has wisely kept America out of the war, but we are arming Ukraine so it can defend itself. Ukraine's victory, or even a relative victory, would benefit the United States. A defeat for Putin would be helpful all around. But this isn't guaranteed. As I said, nobody knows the way this war will go. It's an ugly, tough business. But the free world, a concept, it's a, it's a phrase we don't use very much anymore. The free world counts for something. American leadership since 1945 has brought generations of prosperity and relative peace. There's been no World War III. Billions of people around the world have been lifted out of, po out of poverty because of the American-led peace. Europe, which was the generator of more and more destructive wars, now finds that through the European Union, a war among them is unthinkable. This is real progress. It's something to be proud of. American leadership is like good health. You miss it only when it's gone. So with those remarks, let me stop turn it over to questions and answers. I was told to speak for only a few minutes, so I tried to cover a lot of topics fast, and I'm sorry if I bounced on them, but I wanted to, well, maybe stimulate some tough questions and happy to answer them. And frankly, I wish I were with you in Oakland because one of my daughters lives just up MLK Boulevard in Berkeley. Um, wish I were there, but soon. Thanks for your attention. So, uh, uh, Ambassador, when maybe we'll book you again when you come out to visit your daughter, then you can speak in person. That would be great. 
Um, we do have a microphone. If you have a we question have, from the floor, can we get some uh, lights? Who's on the lights? Turn the lights up a little bit. If you're on Zoom and you want to ask a question, um, put it, put your name in the chat, and I will try and monitor that here if I can. Figure out how to use Shannon's computer. Um, there we go. I'm going. And I'm going with uh, age before beauty. Jack McAvoy is first. Okay, Jack McAvoy, what's your question? Ambassador, thank you for being here today. Um, when, if Putin prevails in uh, Ukraine, what, in your opinion, would be his next target? The two most vulnerable countries. Uh, are George, the Republic of Georgia and the South Caucasus. The Putin seems to be working from, let's say, from within to subvert that country's independence. Moldova, which is located sort of wedged between Romania and Ukraine, not in NATO, not in the EU, pretty poor country. That would be a target of opportunity for Russia. And Putin has made no secret of his desire to reassemble the empire. It's also possible that Putin would increase pressure on the Baltic states. Uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, for a long time under uh, the Russian Empire, then under the Soviet Empire, independent since 91, now members of NATO and the European Union. If Putin wins in Ukraine, he could start, let's say, provocations, uh, little military incidents, probes, uh, assassinations, sabotage, which is, by the way, going on right now in Western Europe, testing NATO. Putin is serious. He means to reassemble the Russian Empire, and he is not adverse to using whatever tactics are at hand to achieve this aim. Who's got the, who's got the mic? Tom, we're going to go, okay, oh. and then Stephanie after that. Mike, Mike Malone, you've got the Thank mic. Thank you. Uh, what role should the relationship between the United States and the Philippines play in the current conflict or possible conflict with China in the South China Sea? Well, I'm not an Asia or Philippine expert, but U.S.-Philippine relations have grown much closer because of Chinese pressure on the Philippines. And that pressure is mounting. It's a mystery to me why China has chosen a course of great power bullying and confrontation when it gets a lot out of the US-led international order. China's made a lot of money because of that order. And in the years of their wisdom, they chose to work with it. Now they are gaming it, taking advantage of it, and trying to bully their neighbors. That's a real problem. And the we don't like having to deal with two great power rivals or adversaries at the same time, but it doesn't matter what we want. That's what we've got. I'm going to intersperse some questions from the chat, uh, Ambassador Freed. Garrett Reed asks, uh, do you think the majority of those in the Donbass and other areas under Russian dominance prefer to be aligned with uh, Russia or Ukraine, and are they entitled to self-determination? Well, there's no evidence that the Ukrainians in the occupied areas would like to live under Russian rule. In fact, after the brutality of Russian rule, the kidnapping of many of their children, I doubt they have much use for Russian rule. As for self-determination, well, countries don't get to invade other countries. And self-determination is an important principle, but so is territorial integrity. And it's one of the myths that Russian speakers in Ukraine were oppressed. They weren't. Uh, President Zelensky is from Eastern Ukraine. And he spoke better Russian than Ukrainian 
He was a popular comedian in Ukraine and in Russia. So the notion that Eastern Ukraine is somehow, belo somehow belongs to Russia is basically Russian inspired mythology. mythology. That's just not true. Uh, Stephanie. Thank you so much for, your, um, for being with us today, Ambassador. I've read and heard criticism that the Biden administration has been too timid in its support of Ukraine, and I'm curious how you feel about that. Well, I'm familiar with that criticism. Um, I think the Biden administration has done a lot for Ukraine. Biden assembled a coalition to support Ukraine. He warned the Ukrainians about the impending invasion. He sent a lot of U.S. military equipment to Ukraine. So they've done a lot. I think some of the criticism comes from the slow and sometimes agonizing decision-making process within the Biden administration about giving Ukraine that or this or that set of advanced weapons, um, tanks, certain kinds of ground attack missiles, F-16s, that sort of thing. And the pattern has been that the administration always ends up giving Ukraine the weapons, but at, only after months of agonizing debate. And that's generated a lot of criticism, some of which I understand. The Biden people would say, look, we're being careful because we are we can't afford to make missteps. And I have some sympathy for that position. It's not easy being responsible for the consequences of your decisions when you're dealing with a war. So I, th I give the Biden administration pretty good marks. But as I said, I wish their decision-making process on certain matters had come with a little extra speed. So from uh, the chat, CJ Hirschfield asks, uh, what do you see for Ukraine if we have a change in administration if Trump is elected? Oh man, wouldn't I like to know. But here's where I see things. In a Trump world, and he himself, seem attracted by some kind of a dirty deal with Putin. Trump seems to have a soft spot for strong men and dictators. He said as much. In the debate, he didn't criticize Putin. He said he would, he, he sa also didn't say he wanted Ukraine to win. He said he wanted peace, but that means in the context, peace on Putin's terms. So that's, those are pretty hard criticisms. However, there are some in the outer Trump world and a lot of people in the Republican Party who still are arguing for U.S. support for Ukraine. Um, Mike Pompeo wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago making that case. Uh, Mark Theusen wrote a long piece in the, uh, in the Washington Post criticizing the Biden administration for lack of support for Ukraine, but his real target was the Trump administration arguing for Trump, uh, a Trump policy of support for Ukraine. And Speaker Mike Johnson about six weeks ago gave a big speech at a Washington think tank also in support of Ukraine. So I think if Trump wins, there will be a, a fight within various corners of Trump world. And I don't know how it'll come out. But what I tell the Europeans is if Trump wins, it's not game over for Ukraine, it's game on. And um, those Europeans who have a pre-existing decent relationship with Donald Trump, I've, I've said, should use it. Um, now, as a citizen, I have my very strong views, but as a foreign policy former professional, um, you never want to just throw up your hands and say, oh my God, it's all over, what a catastrophe. You want to work the problem as best you can. And there is something to work with, even with the outer edges of Trump world, as, at least as I see it. Who's got the mic? Robert Kidd. Oh, sorry. Robert and then Bill, and then I've got one online. Go ahead, Robert. M Mr. Ambassador, uh, a demonstration of the kind of uh, um, tough fight here at Rotary over, over a microphone. Um, a question uh, about Europe in general. It seems like 
Uh, every country has a resurgent uh, right-wing party. Poland, even, even uh, Latvia, I think. Uh, we learned yesterday, uh, or two days ago, that yes, uh, Viktor Orban is, is also a part of that right wing. Uh, how does that play out over time? Uh, and what does that have to say about, about the, 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 um, uh, the strength of NATO's support of Ukraine? Well, you're right that hard right nationalist parties have had a resurgence across let's just say politely, across the, the West generally. And you know, France and Germany, you see that. Certainly Viktor Orban represents that. He's very friendly with Vladimir Putin. In Poland, a centrist, a centrist coalition, very broad coalition, beat the Polish more nationalist party last October, and so they're they're a counter trend. Maybe they they've discovered some secret. I think in the West you are seeing a reaction to economic stresses from the Great Recession and the pandemic, and stresses from immigration, which triggers a reaction not just in the United States but in in countries all over Europe. And I think this is something we need to think about seriously. But it isn't an inevitable wave of kind of anti-liberal authoritarians. These things can be dealt with. They, these parties can be defeated, as Poland showed. Uh, there's a right-wing party with political roots in Ital in the Mussolini era in Italy, but they have uh, taken a course of transatlanticism, pro-NATO, and support for Ukraine. So the, you're right, you're correct, that the right-wing resurgence across the West is a very big deal. And we know from history that these sorts of extremists or left-wing extremists can do a lot of damage. But it's not inevitable. And we'll see what happens in France. Macron has got to deal with a very strong right-wing party, but one that doesn't have a majority in the parliament. And the Germans are dealing, they're having trouble in trying to find a way to deal with the alternative for Deutschland party, which does very well in old East Germany, which is uh, still a very poor area of Germany, deindustrialized, and it gives rise to all those kinds of political movements. So the the fight is on. And liberal parties, I mean that in the broadest sense, pro-democracy parties need to find the right formula for addressing people's concerns. Easier said than done. So we wound up with a really long question and answer, so I'm hoping Bill, yours is short. Go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, my question is this. Uh, how different or how similar is American foreign policy today to uh, George Kennan's uh, coining of the term containment? And I ask it especially with regard to China. Kennan was absolutely spot on brilliant when he outlined that policy. I reread his long telegram written in 1946, and it's a great read. It applies to Putin's Russia. I think with respect to Putin's Russia, Kennan's policy applies. We're going to be in a period of containment of a hostile country for some time. With China, it's more complicated. Even though China is acting as a regional bully, they still get a lot out of the international system, but at the same time, they exploit and gain that system. The Biden administration came up with Europe with a kind of slogan called de-risking, not decoupling from China, not ending uh, Chinese US or Chinese European trade. That's really not possible without tremendous cost and disruption. But de-risking, which means you don't let the Chinese get too much economic leverage over you and you diversify critical supply chains so they can't squeeze us. Now that's easier said than done, but that's that seems to be a pretty sensible approach. 
And I think any administration is going to follow some version of this. Whether a Trump administration could focus on China or whether it would pick fights with everybody simultaneously, I can't say. But there is a, a way forward. Um, and I think Kennan, Kennan's outline doesn't apply quite to China because China too much, has too big an economic profile. It certainly applies to Russia, but Kennan's ability to extract strategic principles from the complexity of an immediate situation is just about unmatched. It's wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to have to cut off that rest of that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we really no appreciate pleasure. the opportunity to have your expertise and your experience. And for me, a history lesson in some regards. Um, for our speakers, we have a gift where we make a donation to the Polio Plus campaign. And we talked about that earlier. And we want to just thank you so much that it will be in your name. Again, thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And we do hope to see you in the East Bay. That would be wonderful. And CJ put it very well in the chat. She said, what a timely presentation by a world expert, like a master class. I've learned more from speakers over the last 30 years in this club as a small entrepreneur. Um, this has really been part of my ongoing education. Wonderful. So with that, I'm going to tee up another kind of speaker for next week. Um, and I did also wanted to thank, you know, Julia Fox and the people that work this room have done such a marvelous job. <laughs> Julie, thank you. And thank you for everybody that helps um, set this up every week. Please bust your tables. And thank you just for, for all the hard work. And next week is Brian Copeland. How many know who Mark Brian is? Brian Copeland is a San Leandro guy. He's a personal friend of mine. He used to be on Who Watched KTVU back in the time. Five years he was a, a host on KTVU. He's a, a comedian. He's an author. He will be talking about his new, his, his new um, thriller book. He has another book he's published. Um, he's a genius, and he also is a great community servant. He was my major comedian for the tuber sclerosis walk. He's always donating his time around the community. He's a really fantastic celebrity in the East Bay. So please bring your friends next week to see Brian. He's going to be great. And he is funny and really, really smart. So with that, I have... It's time for you all to go out into the community and make some magic and stay positive and be kind thank you this meeting's adjourned <laughs> <laughs>